This evening on The Rock Newman Show, Cuban jazz artist Alfredo Rodriguez showcases his new album, Tocororo, and talks about being mentored by music legend Quincy Jones. That's coming up right now on The Rock Newman Show. Welcome to The Rock Newman Show from the campus of historic Howard University, located in the nation's capital. I'm Rock Newman, and it is my desire to inspire you with personal stories of extraordinary achievement. Jazz musician Alfredo Rodriguez must have phenomenal talent to make his way from Cuba into the inner circle of the renowned composer Quincy Jones. But don't take my word for it. Listen to what Q, Quincy, has to say about Alfredo. He's got it. Just do whatever it takes, you know, for him to go all the way with it. He understands that to, to express the emotion completely, you have to have the, the, the science and, and the craft behind you, and that comes from the work, and you put him to it. He's a great human being. And that's why he practices 14 hours a day, and he's humble, open-minded, and I love that, you know. I have seven kids of my own, you know, but he's like my son, too. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you, Thank so, you so much, much for joining us here at the Rock Newman Show today. Thank you. Great honor for me to be here. Well, we are absolutely honored to have you. Thank um, you. There's so much music that we're going to talk about, and you've been, <laughs> you've, been, you've been gracious enough <clears throat> to say that you'll perform for us, so we can't wait for that. Before we go to the music, this is an interesting time mm -hmm. that l in the, within the last 10 days, the president of the United States and his wife mm -hmm. and uh, children, they were in Cuba. Mm -hmm. They met with and talked big politics with Raul Castro, the leader of Cuba. Uh, they enjoyed a baseball game together. Mm -hmm. As an individual born in Cuba, most of your life you spent there. When you saw those images on the television, Tell us how you felt. I'm just hoping for the best. Um, I think um, we've been so many years um, apart uh, and far away, and we're very close. Yeah. So I, I always, my, the, music, the message that I want to trans, you know, express with my music is, is about unity and about being together, um, knowing where we're coming from and trying to help each other and share who we are. So I guess that is what I would like to happen between the two countries, United States and Cuba. And now that I've been living here in the United States, I feel for both countries, not just for my own country, which is Cuba. So I just hope for the best, and I hope this is just the beginning of a good relationship between between United States and Cuba. Okay. Um, it, it made, knowing that I was going to talk to you, and I don't, think it's uh, any problem sharing your age. You're 30 years I'm old. I'm 30 years old. 30 yeah. years old. Yeah. Um, so it was in, you were a teenager when there was an incident that just was top of the news here in the U.S. and around the world, and it involved a Cuban kid, mm. Ilian Elian Gonzalez. Gonzalez. Yeah. yeah. So at the time you were whatever, 14 or so. Yeah. Can you, were you aware that that was going on at that time? And, yeah, yeah. And what do you remember about that? Well, I remember everyone talking mm -hmm. about, about, about that every day <laughs> in Cuba. Yeah. That was really, really a big, you know, um, issue. And uh, I remember everything, you know, they, they were talking about that all, all the time. I yeah. remember when Elian came here, uh, well, tried to come here to the United States with, uh, by water, as many Cubans have done. Yeah. And unfortunately, his, his mother died on yeah. the sea and all the situation of, with his uncle, I think, yeah. here in the United States in Miami and his father back in Cuba trying to yeah. get him back. I remember, you know, well, I wasn't in area, but I, I remember. Yeah. Was it your sense then that the Cuban people were rooting for him to be able to stay in the United States where he'd make a new life or rooting that the father would be able to get him and bring him back. Do you remember? 
Well, um, when you, you mean Cuban people in Cuba in or Cuba, United States? In Cuba, yeah. uh, In Cuba, I, I think, may, well, well, you know how we are human beings. I'm pretty sure that they were both um, both kind of s thoughts. But but I, I in, in my my opinion, I think more, most of the people wanted to him to be with his father, I guess. Mm -hmm. And uh, mm -hmm. that was what happened at the end. Let's talk about Alfredo Rodriguez. <laughs> I want you to go back. I've had some guests here who are like in their 70s, mm. and I've asked them to go back and to retrace what their first memory was. Mm. What's one of the first things they remember as a very small child? Mm. I'd like you to do that. Well, I remember, you know, I was a very, um, very simple kid, uh, just running the streets like all Cubans do. And, playing with my friends. Uh, although I remember that a lot of the times I had to stay <laughs> practicing the piano before <laughs> going to play with my, with my friends. Uh, okay, you said practicing the piano. When mm -hmm. did you start? I started at six years old, six, seven years old at the, uh, playing the piano. And at the school, uh, seven, eight years old. Okay. Now practicing. starting to play, was that because someone suggested or insisted that you do that? Well, did you have, uh, was it your, was it you that wanted to pursue yeah, that at such an early age? Yeah, definitely. I wanted to be a musician. I didn't want to be a pianist at first. Uh -huh. I wanted to be a drummer. I remember my, uh, my father uh, playing music in our house and me trying to imitate the drums with uh -huh. anything I could get, you know, like, like trying to make sounds, like uh -huh. percussive sounds. Uh -huh. Um, you want to give me a demonstration? As it <laughs> I will. I will give it to you later. You know, because <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> <laughs> the piano is a percussive instrument, and I use it in that way a lot. I uh -huh. guess the percussion is is something that I've been very attractive, you know, attracted to uh -huh. since I was very young. Uh -huh. And I, I, I guess I did that. That was what I decided to to be a musician because all the sounds that were around. Mm -hmm. Me, I wanted to, you know, find a language which could be better than just talking. That could, that it's I could to find a language. Yes, to find a language. I, I, I was in, in the need of that, I guess, and mm -hmm. I, I found out with, with musical sounds when I, when I, well, as I said, my, my parents and well, actually, my father is a musician. He's a singer as well. Okay. So he had a, a band, mm -hmm. and some of his musicians told him that I had. Um, good options to be a musician because I was, you know, very interested uh -huh. in that. So, so they were saying, so the, the members of his band were looking at you yes. and saying, hey, this kid's a natural. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Exactly that. And, and they brought me to the classical school of music and that was why I started at seven years old. Uh -huh. Because, you know, I, I went to, all of these kids goes to, uh, through this test and they choose uh, some kids to start. Yeah. studying classical music and that was how I started. Uh -huh. So, and, and when you started, do you remember, did you have, did something strike you and were you inspired to think mm -hmm. that this is really what I want to do for the rest of my life? Was it something you were just exploring? What, what well, how as, did as, it resonate as, with you? As I said, you know, I, uh, uh, I knew that I wanted to be a musician since very young. Uh -huh. um, I would say four or five years old because I, 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 everything that I wanted to do was related to music. Right. But I didn't know I wanted to be a pianist. You uh -huh. know? Uh, so I started at seven with a piano, having in mind that I was going to change at, right. ten, at 10 years old to drums. Uh -huh. um, but you know, I was completely falling in love with the instrument at the piano when, you know, when, when I started playing the music. And, and I think, um, to answer your question, I, at first I was doing it because I love it and everything, but I didn't, I think when I was like, you know, like 12 or 13 years old, I realized that this is what I'm going to do uh -huh. for, you know, in my life. Because I, I realized at that time that my parents didn't have to tell me anymore, you need to practice yeah. in order to make it. If yeah. you want to do this, you yeah. need to, you know, sacrifice a lot of things and right. just do what you love to do. And, you know, you sometimes need to tell your kids that they need to study yeah. and in order to, to make it in their lives. And I didn't, I didn't need that anymore. You said, I was falling in love. Mm -hmm. I was falling in love with the piano. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? How did that feel? It's very difficult because for me explaining that 
that feeling with words is is it would be very difficult and even more now that I'm just trying to talk with this broken English. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'll tell you something. But uh, take your time because that's such an imp you know that's such a fascinating thing mm -hmm. that at that age, 10, 11 years old, that you are able to articulate 20 years later, man, I was falling in love with it. And I guess, you know, if I can help you along or something, mm -hmm. it was like what did it feel like? How I guess it's about feeling. I guess it's, yeah. it's something natural also that we that we that I felt felt with music since I heard. You know, it's it's something that you just feel. Uh, it's very powerful and it mm -hmm. moves you and it inspires you to do something for that. And, and so that feeling, <coughs> you feel that throughout your body, sort of your thought process. Mm -hmm. Do you feel as if there are times when you're connected to your instrument. You are connected there to mm -hmm. the instrument. Sure. But it's not just you, the person. There's a, even a higher power that's involved. Yeah, definitely. A lot of the times. Actually, when I see myself playing, I don't recognize sometimes myself. I am, I am, I guess I'm a, kind of a different person sometimes when I'm playing than when I'm talking or doing other things in my life. I guess I cannot transform in, it's me, but at the same time, some energy, some, but I guess it's positive because uh, I enjoy a lot. So I, I, I just, I just like that process. And um, I guess it's about energy connection and. Energy and connection. I want to take a break here mm. so that our viewing audience mm -hmm. can see you and they can feel you and be connected to you Sounds good. with what you do. You will play for us? Yeah, of course. Thank you.
how long each day did you find yourself engaged in preparing for what you wanted to do for the rest of your life? A lot. And I said that because I, you know, since, since very young, I've been thinking of music a lot of the time in, mm -hmm. during my day. Mm -hmm. um, practicing with the instrument, I guess at that time I was, you know, like four, three, half, four hours every day. Every day. But thinking about the music, which is practicing a lot, is, mm -hmm. is the same as practicing for me. And mm -hmm. I've been doing that uh, thing, you know, since that moment and uh, trying to relate. Well, the thing is like music is so powerful for, uh, in my life that I just relate music with everything mm -hmm. that I experience in my life. Mm -hmm. So I guess that is a way, that is a non-stop practice all the time mm -hmm. with a connection between me and, 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 and the music, even though if, if I am not with the piano. Because every sound that I hear on the streets or water or it can be like construction or some problem that I see, I just relate it, you know, because movement or because anything, anything, I just try to, to relate it. Uh -huh. And talking is yeah. the same with talking, improvising, you yeah. know, wh what we're doing right now, improvising, yeah. which was the same that I was just, um, you know, just doing the piano. Yeah. I sit and just play whatever it, you're feeling at the moment. So three and a half, four hours, I'm um, three and a half or four hours actually playing. At that time. But your reality when you were 14, mm -hmm. 15, 16 years old growing was that music was upon you and in you mm -hmm. and you were about music like all the time. And it has been like that since, since that moment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It keeps growing up. <laughs> Still? Yeah, still, yeah. It feels every day I, for some reason, I just was there translate a moment, everything. Was there a moment in that journey, let's say like during your teenage years, mm -hmm. where you felt a sense of confidence that you were good? Uh, I don't know about that. Mm -hmm. I don't know about that. I never... I never thought about that. Are you good yet? Again, for me, for me, it's not about being good. It's about being happy. Okay. And I'm for sure very happy with what I do, and I feel very honest with what you, I. You, you say you feel very honest. Yes, about what I do. I just, I just do what I, what I love to do, okay. and I am, I am very happy, and okay. I hope I. Keep you know, I keep in this way in my life because so it tell, makes sense for me. Tell us about how you came to be able to perform mm -hmm. at a place far away from Cuba, mm. where you were seen and actually judged. Quincy Jones was a judge mm. at a competition that yeah. you were playing at. First of all, do you remember the process for? how you were selected to play in that competition? Yeah, I was, I remember I was at the first year of the university of classical music. And it came this, um, I don't know how to call it, maybe application, something mm -hmm. like that, that, that they wanted to um, include Cuban pianists mm -hmm. in, in, in this festival right. competition. So uh, I was one of the two pianists selected to go there. We sent it like a demo. They requested like demo from different pianists, and they selected two. I was one of them, and very fortunate, fortunately for me, I was you know because Cloud Knobs, which was the president of the festival, the Montreux Festival. This was in Switzerland, mm -hmm. and um, <coughs> he used to do a lot of jam sessions at his house. And where I met Quincy was at his house, uh -huh. and and he said to all of us, uh, when I say all, all of us is all the um, pianists that we were part of, of that competition. He said right. that Quincy Jones was coming right. if we could play a song each for him. Yeah. Of course, we said yes. Yeah. And um, Stop for a moment. Okay. So here's a guy at the Montreux Jazz Festival in Switzerland. Mm -hmm. And he tells you that you're getting ready to meet Quincy Jones. Uh -huh. How did you feel at that moment? To be honest with you, I, I always been very um, natural and spontaneous in those kind of moments. You know, it, uh, even though if, if it's some, someone that I admire and I yeah. respect a lot, yeah. I always keep it in my way. You know, I just, uh -huh. I just 
love what I do yeah for okay. it's the same you know like equally for for everyone mm -hmm. you know uh, but I knew uh, you know that, that someone you that your, I admired you, you so kept much. your composure yeah yeah I because you're a cool jazz dude <laughs> oh no 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 no! Not even that. It's just it's just I guess it's it's part of my personality. Okay. And and, and uh, I but I was very excited. Yeah. I was very excited okay. that I could that I was going to have that opportunity to play mm -hmm. for Quincy Jones. Mm -hmm. And um, I remember I played one of my songs and and I remember also we had we had a great connection from the beginning. You know me and Quincy. Tell uh, me about tell me about that connection. Yeah. Um, First of all, after after that, Quincy came. I remember he came to me and he said that that he liked it a lot. That my, my point of view, what I was what I was doing with the music, and, and that he wanted to get in in you know keep in touch with me, and he wanted to help me in my career. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, I was I was blown away at that at that moment when when he told me that. Even though I knew that I was living in Cuba, yeah. and he is living course, in the U.S., right? living in the U.S. in the U.S., and I knew that it was going to be very difficult, and it was. It was very difficult to create something together. That was in 2006. 2006. And I right? came here to United States in 2009. Right. So it was three years of yeah. analyzing and processing what yeah. could we do together, and, yeah. and it was very impossible for us to do. At that time, we couldn't do anything between Cuba and the United States. Right. You Not know, like now that a lot of. Right. Friends from Cuba are coming and yeah. playing and sharing yeah. music. And I, and I want to go back to that 2006 time. Mm -hmm. So you have this great experience with, with Quincy Jones, mm -hmm. one of the greatest of all times. Mm -hmm. You go back. He said he wants to work with you. It would, I would think that would be pretty much any musician's dream. Mm -hmm. So you go back and you're dreaming about working with Quincy. Mm -hmm. Well, I actually, I, I just took the, 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 the occasion as as a great experience in my life. I mm -hmm. was going to have something very powerful and important for me yeah. to tell my friends, my family, uh, that yeah. I had the opportunity to play for Quincy Young's son. And mm -hmm. I knew, I knew it was gonna be difficult. And sometimes, you know, uh, we go places and, and some it's the reality. If some, sometimes people tell you that they're going to do this and that and yeah. nothing happens. Don't do anything, right. So, sure. um, Everything changes when I went back to Cuba because Adam Fell, my manager today, which is Quincy's manager, he wrote me an email saying yeah. that the same, you know, like yeah. Quincy gave him my information and mm. they were very interested in helping me. I knew mm. that, you know, that uh -huh. something, I had to do something in order to make it mm. happen. So what I want to tap into is that time when you're back there with your family and there is the possibility of me of defecting or of going, def yeah. yeah. Was that a scary time for you? Yeah, yeah, of course. Oh, I'm, and I'm, I have to say, I'm very, uh, my family is, is a very close family and we're very, um, we're very close. Yeah. So I guess, you know, all, all every, um, you know, every time that the family needs to, you know, like physically separate. separate. Yeah. I would say physically because spiritually we are very connected sure. and very close, but physically I had to do it in yeah. order to come, in order to work with Quincy. So mm -hmm. it was a very difficult difficult time for me, and also when I, you know, because after comes that in 2009, after all of this um, process of thinking and trying to figure it out what I was going to do with my life in order right. to work with Mr. Jones, I had to defect. I was playing with my father. Yeah. In Mexico, yeah. In before you, before you, before you tell that, because we definitely want to hear about that. Mm -hmm. But the again, I want to deal with the process mm -hmm. of your considering defecting. Mm -hmm. So is that something that you talk into very close circles about, so that the mm -hmm. authorities don't become aware of yeah, what yeah. you might be? Yeah. How does what What did you do? I mean, just my family. Just my family knew that I wanted to do something like that, and and no one else. Right. It's not something that you go out and tell, and tell people because you know you yeah. know it could it could be a big problem for you if you tell people what you're going to do sometimes and right. unfortunately it's that way yeah. and um, I had to keep it secret and yeah. um, okay so now tell us about you uh, y you've made you made the decision at some point mm -hmm. obviously mm -hmm. in consultation with your family mm -hmm. that at some point you're going to defect. Mm -hmm. And when did that moment come? Well, that came, um, 
when I was playing with my with my dad in Mexico, in in Merida, Yucatan, and I told my dad and my mom that I was I was going to do it because you know sometimes you you said you know I want to do this, I want to do that, but when the moment comes yeah. and you have to do it, you yeah. know that that is the yeah. change. You know that is when yeah. every everyone knows that you are doing it for sure. Mm -hmm. And I knew that I was gonna do it for sure. You know, it maybe I didn't know maybe like when I was going to do it in my right. life, or right. I, because I have to say this also. I want I felt uh, being in Cuba. We we have had for so many years. This is a contradiction that we have had in Cuba. Is that we have created a very powerful and unique culture because we've been all around Cubans for so many years. Mm -hmm. So we have to invent in order to mm -hmm. keep going. And mm -hmm. I guess that in that 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 thing of that you have to invent in order to create and yeah. keep you know and keep living every day yeah. have made us very unique mm -hmm. and um, but the contradiction comes that we haven't had any transculturation or confrontation with different countries yeah. for so many years right. I felt that I was in the need of that I, yeah. I felt that I wanted to go to a different country and meet new culture meet new people what they have to offer yeah. to me and, uh, so you're in Mexico. So I was in Mexico, and I told my dad and my mom that I was going to the this, sex. This is the time. This is the time. And I took, uh, I didn't have any guidance or someone tell me what I have to do, right? right. So I took a plane from Merida, Yucatan to um, Nuevo Laredo, Mexico. Mm -hmm. And I did it wrong because if you fly, <laughs> if you're a Cuban, you fly to the closest city in the border, you can be arrested. Okay. And that was why I got arrested there, and I was, you know. Now, when you went to Mexico, did you all play the gig? Did you play? Yes, the, yes Okay, so yes. you played the gig. We played the gig. After the after we played the gig, I told my dad, now is the time, yeah. I'm just going. So, so, so you're there, and you're departing, leaving your family. Mm -hmm. Your family is going back to Mexico. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so you, you I mean, to, 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 uh, into, back to Cuba. So you go into another place closer to the border. Yes. Where... You're at risk whenever you yes. do that. I didn't know that. To be arrested, okay. So, you know, they interrogate me there for, um, interview me for so many hours and trying to see what I was going to do. And I told them straight, you know, I'm just going to cross the border. I'm going to go to the United States because my dream is to play music and I just want to change in my life. And at first they didn't understand. They said, why is this kid telling me all of this, you know? Um, but they re realized after, you know, after three or four hours talking to me that I was completely decided what I wanted to do and I didn't, I, I wasn't doing anything wrong and they understood fortunately for me and they, I, they actually put me in a cab and sent me to the border. Now, was it, because I did a little research, mm -hmm. was it at the border when you were detained and had to no, sleep on no. the floor or was this when you were being interrogated? Well, uh, when I was detained, was at the airport. Yeah. Uh, once you come to the border, the situation is that you ask for uh, political asylum right. as a Cuban. Right. And yes, I slept in the floor and everything, but again, that, that I wasn't arrested at that moment. Well, mm -hmm. I don't know if that is called arrested here in the United States. It's up. kind of, yeah, yeah, it's kind of, um, uh -huh. yeah. So when you, were, when you were held at the, at the airport and they were questioning you, mm -hmm. Were you terribly frightened at that moment, or what were you, what, what did you what were you what were your feelings then? I was kind of scared in a way that something was very different to me, and the most scary part was that I could be deported back to Cuba. Yeah, and it was going to be even more difficult for me to go out to Cuba. Right, that was the scary part. Um, Everything else, I have to be honest, it was kind of like I I I was very positive in, a, in I'm a very positive person in mm -hmm. general, and I was. I told them, you know, I am going to try to do this, uh, and I'm going to risk as much as I <laughs> as I can yeah. to do it. You know, I don't. It's not like I'm talking to you like you you are an ex expert in this particular area. I'm but I want to ask you about how you felt that if you had gone back to Cuba, mm -hmm. deported back, mm -hmm. which they would then have known mm -hmm. that it was your attempt mm -hmm. to be able to de to get away. Mm -hmm. Do you think you would have been treated harshly? I don't know. Maybe, maybe um, I don't know exactly what would have happened with me. Yeah. Um, 
because with every person is, is different. Mm. Uh, but what I know from uh, baseball players that have done stuff like that mm. is they sometimes they didn't want them to be any more part of their teams. Uh, yeah or they made it very difficult for them to go out of the country, and some of them had to go through water, like Elian Gonzalez. Mm -hmm. And, um, but I don't know, you know, and as, as you say, I have to be honest, I'm not kind of like uh, an expert on what is yeah. going to happen all the time with this person or the other one. I just knew that it was gonna be difficult because mm -hmm. it was still difficult, you know, just not just to go out for everyone to go out to the country, but to share my music yeah. and, it was difficult, yeah. Okay, so you finally, at what point was it when they said to you, you were going to be able to come into the U.S.? What? Do you mean uh, uh, while I was at the border? Yeah. Well, I arrived there uh, on, the night, on the night of January 16th, mm -hmm. and they released me um, next day. Mm -hmm. Um, in the morning, I remember, and at that point, at that day, I called Adam. You yeah. know, because uh, I I was t I was in connection with with Adam and uh, with Quincy, and they said if I could make it to the United States, they were going to help me. So, yeah. um, I called them and I told them I I made it. I'm here in the United States now because I was now in in Laredo, Texas. Uh -huh. So they bought a ticket for me, and yeah. I, I was on a plane that day to, to Los Angeles. And so you land, different you, process too. You, 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 <laughs> land in, you land in Los Angeles. Yeah. And did Adam meet you or someone else meet you? Well, Adam, uh, since, since and the I came. Adam, the, I want to tell my viewing audience, the Adam that we're talking about mm. is truly Quincy Jones, I'll call it Quincy Jones's rock. Mm -hmm. He is your, he's your manager now. Yeah. But he is the person that really holds it down for Quincy and sort of handles mm -hmm. and manages mm -hmm. all that Quincy does. Uh huh. Correct. Um, so he meets you at Los Angeles Airport. Yeah, I was very fortunate that uh, he was kind of in my generation. He's he's in his thirties too, so yeah. he was very helpful. That uh, that we were that we were kind of you know rooting for the same. And, yeah. and he of course, at this time you were speaking very little English. Well, none. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was very difficult, you know. Mm. They took a big risk, and, mm -hmm. and but I, I always, you know, I'm very thankful for him and his family. Since I came here to the United States, uh, they were like my family. And because you, you initially went and stayed with uh, yes, where, where I Adam stayed. was, and slept on a couch for a good yes. little period of time. Yes, mm -hmm. I. They called me the Harry Potter <laughs> <laughs> of of their house because <laughs> I, I used to sleep, you know, in their couch and and. You know, it, it was it was a very interesting time in my life where I learned a lot also and, and grew up even, you know. Did you ever have any thoughts that maybe I haven't made the right decision? Did you ever question that? No. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. No, no, no. I knew. I knew what I was doing and I knew that I knew that, that this was a good, sh a, a good de uh, decision for my life. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. I wanted to do it. I wanted to do it. not, you know, like I, I, I was in the need of that kind of liberty that uh, a country like United States gives you also, mm -hmm. and 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 I'm very fortunate to be part of this of this country now. Yeah. So you get now and you get to spend some time with the maestro, mm -hmm. with Quincy Jones. Mm -hmm. Tell us about what about his influence on you mm. and how it has helped you to advance. So much. Quincy is someone that um, knows about everything, man. <laughs> he has a lot of experience and he has done a lot. And he, he not just, you know, I'm not talking just about music. I'm yeah. talking about, about e every aspect of life. And, and he's a very humble person where I learned and um, from him every day um, mm -hmm. about his way of connecting with people, his mm -hmm. way of sharing who he is and where he's coming from mm -hmm. and the message of not just his music but his life in general. And mm -hmm. I've been learning that and also the first thing that he told me was just to be myself and to, you know, to fight for who I am and, and my roots mm -hmm. and uh, someone, I'm very fortunate. 
I am very fortunate to be on, you know, learning from someone like him uh, from this very, uh, from very, very young age mm. in my life, and and I hope I can do the same with uh, with people and and, and kids uh, who are interested in in listening to myself, and, mm -hmm. and I would love to do that. Mm. You know, you know, th throughout my life, I've been a true, I've been a lover of of music not necessarily that big of a fan of jazz. Not, I'm a r and guy kind of mm -hmm. through and through. <laughs> and um, your, I don't know if we can see this, uh, <laughs> your new album, Tokororo. Mm -hmm. First of all, where's the name Tokororo come from? Oh, Tokororo is the national bird. We made a kaleidoscope with the, with the bird. It's the national bird of Cuba. Mm -hmm. and as you can see, Cuba is very present in my music all the time. Yeah. And, but this album is also um, is very global in a way um, because we include a lot of artists from many countries like France, Lebanon, India, Spain, Cameroon. Um, and so, when you Cuba. Set, when you when, when when you set out to do this, mm -hmm. was it your idea? of sort of connecting Cuba to the rest of the world and connecting the rest of the world to Cuba. What were some of your motivations for this? Well, yeah, definitely that is one of, that is one of the ideas that, that I always want to uh, share with my music and express mm -hmm. with my music, is the desire of sharing who we are with the world and also learn from, uh, it's the same like, you know, I, I, I play what I live. So you, you play what you live. Yes. Uh -huh. So so basically, I am just creating this music because the way that I have lived my life, and and this is the process that I've been living lately in my life since I came here to the United States. Mm -hmm. I've been meeting a lot of people. I've been learning from a lot of people from around the world, right. and and this is why Tokororo uh, sounds like a very global album, and not just about again. You know, I. I call my music music. Yeah. I, I it's, it's not just about Cuban music or classical or jazz or world music. I, I just call it music. I, I, I create I create the sounds that from the sounds that sounds right to me. Yeah. Right? What yeah. I was saying, you know, if I listen to a bird singing, I yeah. will try to imitate that with music. Yeah. And some people will call it jazz, some people yeah. will call it classical, some people will call it whatever, mm -hmm. or I call it music, you mm -hmm. know what I'm saying? For mm -hmm. me, it's, it's... I remember a scene from a James Brown movie when somebody was asking him, you know, were, were, was telling him, well, maybe you shouldn't play that. Mm. And he said, does it sound good? Mm. And the guy said, yeah, he said, well, I'm going to play it. Mm. You know, it sounds good to me. Mm. I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to play it. That is what I try to do also. You perform um, two nights from now at the University of Maryland, the Clary Smith Center. Mm -hmm. When your audience comes in and they're in the seat, what is, it, what is your hope as an artist that you're communicating to them? In a perfect world, mm -hmm. how would they feel when they, when they leave seeing one of your performances? Well, as I said, you know, I, my hope always will be that they get the message that I am being completely honest with myself. I am not, I am just being who I am and I am sharing 100% of my life with them at that moment. I am going to give it all and, uh, and my hope is that they get that message and we are going to experience feelings each other because I also get energy and, connect, and, and connected with the audience since what we do is improvising. Provising is about everything are, it, it is, are, is around us. Mm -hmm. So the audience is very important, at least for me, to my music. Mm -hmm. And um, every time is different, as you can as you can imagine. So it's 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 very interesting. It's very interesting to go to different places and and play music and see the reaction of people, which always is is different because their culture, their education. Yeah. And um, I'm just looking forward to share who I am and, and have, a, have a good time. Let me ask you, have you had an experience where you have played and something happened during the performance 
or even some, something happened after the performance where someone has come up to you and expressed something about how they felt that like stands out in your memory? Well, I, I, I have many, many different experiences. Some people come, come, come at you crying and saying that they felt for some reason some feelings that made made them cry. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have necessarily to be about playing sad music yeah, or right, something uh -huh. like that. Mm -hmm. um, and some people come very excited and, and just, it's, it's great to see how human beings react to music. Mm -hmm. and, and, and for me, uh, which I'm a performer, it's, it's, it's really interesting to see, to see that reaction uh, from not just my music, our music I call it because there are many people, at least in this, you know, it's not a conversation with me. A conversation mm -hmm. with myself would be if I play piano solo. Mm -hmm. But when I play with different musicians, that, which is what we're going to do on, on Friday, um, it's a conversation between ourselves. Yeah. And, um, but again, yeah, I, I, I love how human beings react and not just to my music. That is, that is how I create also. Mm -hmm. You know, some people, some people perform and they perform to make a living. Mm. You know, they're good at what they do mm -hmm. and they, hey, I'm going to go out here, man, I'm going to work and I'm going to, I'm going to make a good living doing this. Mm -hmm. from, Me too. From, okay. From all, In a way. Yeah. From, <laughs> all, from all that I'm hearing from you though, it's like you live yeah. to perform. You live to yeah. do this. Yeah, well, I was, what I was saying, yeah, because maybe I didn't understand, but um, yeah, me too, because I, I just, again, I, it's like water for me, right? Mm -hmm. Something that we need every day in order to keep living. Yeah. It's the same with music. If I didn't have music, I'm pretty sure that I would, I would die of sinus. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like the tokororo. Mm -hmm. Tokororo is an animal that if cage dies because it needs the the liberty. Yeah. It, yeah. it needs to fly. Yeah. yeah. So it's the same with my music. My music I, I feel that, that I that I need music. Uh, music feeds you, music more, allows yeah. you to live. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. For sure. Yeah. Um talk to me about what you envision for the future. Learning as much as I can. Um, always have been my my main goal. I'm always looking for for meeting new people, learning from different experiences, and and I know that in the, in a way, always is 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 my my brain translate all of those experiences into into music, and and I'm very looking forward to that, and also I'm very looking forward to you know to unite people and try to try to make a peaceful world. Uh, we are in, in the need of that also. We yeah. need we need to stop the war and make more uh, love to for flowers. We don't need more uh, guns. Yeah. We need flowers and, and peace. And peace. Yeah. And that is that is what I envision in my life. I am I am I am you know given to people mm -hmm. uh, my best, yeah. which is creating music, and I hope with that. Uh, is my apart to to trying to make a peaceful world. I guess that is the best I have in order to share with people and in order to to keep the world as peaceful as as, as I can. Mm -hmm. um, so for your performance on Friday night mm -hmm. at the University of Maryland, you're playing with a you say you're playing with a group of guys. Mm -hmm. Okay, and you're talking about uh, uh, improvising. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, now, do you have a preference as to doing it that way, or are you more comfortable and would you rather play by yourself? No, uh, both are different, and I learn from the two different experiences. Uh, but I love playing with, with other musicians because I get their their message as well. It's mm -hmm. not just me. Um, it's not just me talking. Mm -hmm. it's, it's me talking with people and 
interacting. Mm -hmm. I like that a lot. So, so you guys are having a conversation with your with your in your instruments are really definitely we just have a conversation. We just have few messages that we want to say, and we have different songs that we like to play with and and create around with. But mm -hmm. but basically, basically yes, we're mm -hmm. coming from different cultures. Uh, the drummer is from Puerto Rico, and the bass player is from Bulgaria. Mm -hmm. Peter Slavo from bass and Henry Cole on drums. And I I just feel very fortunate to to be talking to them and making. And energy and you know and a lot of kids together. who get into j different uh, whether it's sports or music or whatever somebody might say I want to be like uh, Willie Mays the baseball player Michael Jordan the basketball player uh, Michael Jackson you know mm -hmm. considered mm -hmm. to be one of the greatest performers I want to be that way did you have any particular pianist that you looked up to as you know uh, someone who was inspiring to you many uh, Many, and not just pianists. Mm -hmm. But if we talk about pianists, <coughs> I would say Johann Sebastian Bach, and I would say Thelonious Monk, which uh -huh. are very different very in different. a way, but, yeah. but I love their, the way that they created music. And, um, but again, I will talk also of, about people like Good Jeff, or, or I would talk about Krishnamurti. And I, I, I don't you know what? Those two names you first gave me, mm -hmm. Bach, mm -hmm. Johann Christian Bach, and Thelonious Monk. Mm -hmm. Very, very different. But if you could grab an element from Bach that makes you, that made you just like really like him, and one from Thelonious Monk also, what would they be? Mm. Just one element. I think it's just. I think it's. it's I think it's everything. It's, it's it's kind of difficult for me just to pick a little thing of them because mm -hmm. it's about their personality, the way that they express their self and the way that they found a voice, a unique voice, you mm -hmm. know, just to express themselves and make something very powerful for the world of music. Um, I guess I, I, I don't, I, I, it would be very difficult for me to, to pick something, just, just a little an element from, from them. But yeah, I, I, just, I just feel the connection. Mm -hmm. what the message that they wanted to mm -hmm. express. When, when folks, when I started promoting that I was going to have you on the show, mm -hmm. I got multiple inquiries as to your social status, mm. whether you are an eligible bachelor or not. <laughs> and I promised that I would ask that question. Yeah, of course. Well, I, I, I have a girlfriend. Okay. Mm. Okay. So all the rest of y'all... Time out, time out, time out, time out, and take a break. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, any plans to get married and have have, have little Alfredos? Well, yeah, leave, yeah, maybe no Alfredos, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, of course, I love kids. I love kids, and <coughs> I I always learn a lot from them, yeah. and I would love to to have some kids also to. To learn also from them, and uh, yeah, I'm very interested about about how they they are very spontaneous, they are very natural, they are very honest. Mm -hmm. They they are just them. They are yeah. they don't care too much about what is around, and yeah. I love that. You know, Alfredo, I say at the start of this show that I hope to inspire people with uh, stories of extraordinary achievement. And when I became aware of you, your story through uh, Adam Fell. Uh, I immediately got in touch with Adam mm. because I thought that your journey is one that has been of great inspiration. And I wanted my audience to become exposed to you and aware of you. I really genuinely from my heart believe that you are a magnificent, wonderful ambassador. And I can't thank you enough. Thank for joining so me today, man. We will follow your career very, very closely. Thank you so much for the Folks, interview. that wraps us for this evening. For more information on this program or any other program produced by WHUT, go to WHUT.org. And if you want to see Alfredo live, catch him at the Clarice Smith Performing Arts Center in College Park on Friday, April 1st. I'll leave you with some more of Alfredo's music from right here at the WHUT studios. Goodbye and God bless.
This program was produced by WHUT, Howard University Television, and made possible by contributions from viewers like you. Thank you.